Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thanks so much for joining us today for High Flying Design. We are so thrilled that you could be here and we'll be answering a number of your questions throughout the program if you have them. My name is Alicia and I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York City. I'll be your host for today. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free, but if you'd like to support us in delivering this content, please do click on the link in the comments or in the description. So feel free to use the chat today. Say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know maybe if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before. And let's go ahead and get started. So once again, my name is Alicia. And, you know, here at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum, our mission is to honor our heroes, educate the public and inspire our youth. And today we are going to be talking about aviation and how the designs of airplanes allow them to fly way up high in the sky. But before we get started, I want to ask you to grab two things if you'd like to do an activity with me at the end. We are going to be making a really neat paper airplane, and all you are going to need for this is one eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. Something preferably that you don't need, it's not very important to you, something like a piece of homework or something like that. And also a pair of scissors. Now, uh, of course, if you can't use scissors, that's all right. We can also just uh, use our fingers and tear them as well. So we'll get onto that project in just a bit. Without further ado though, let's get started on the program. So for those of you who may not be familiar, this is the Intrepid Museum. So we are located on the west side of Manhattan in the Hudson River in a historic World War II era aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. And as you can see in this picture, everyone, it is really, really big. Our ship is 913 feet long. Now that is so big that if you took it and stood it up on its end, it would be just about as tall as a New York City skyscraper. And it's also so long that you could pretty much play three games of football on top at the same time. Now, it was, of course, constructed a long time ago, way back in 1943, and for a very specific purpose. It was made during a time when we were fighting countries all the way across oceans. And, of course, we didn't want to have to launch our planes over here in America and then fly them all the way across the water to get over there, because that'd take too much fuel, take too much time. And so we created things like the Intrepid. Now, does anyone out there happen to know what we might call something like that? Go ahead and tell me in the chat if you happen to know what type of a ship is the Intrepid? What do we call a ship that lets us transport or carry a bunch of airplanes while out there on the water and even help them to take off and land out there in the ocean too? Anyone happen to know? Well, everyone, if you said an aircraft carrier, you would be correct. So again, not only can ships like this carry aircraft, but also they let us launch and land just like a floating airport, pretty much. So our ship was in service from 1943 to 1974, and it later became a museum in 1982. So, of course, everyone, being a museum, we like to display lots and lots of very cool things like these. Yeah, right? <laughs> now, all right, looking at this picture, I know you might be thinking, what? Chairs? What? Why do you have chairs on display? Well, these are artifacts, and they can tell us a lot about what life was like on board the ship a long time ago. So if you look at this picture here, some of them might look kind of common, maybe similar to chairs that you might even have in your house or at work or maybe at school. And some of them might look a little bit more complicated. But this, everyone, looking at this display is a wonderful way for us to examine the variety of jobs that people had on board a ship, just like the Intrepid. When we take a look closer here, we can actually make some guesses about these jobs and about different positions on the ship. So we can think about what they were used based on uh, how they look, maybe if we've also seen them before. And we can also think about where they might have actually been located on the ship itself. So everyone, take a second. Take a look at the screen here and take a look for me. Tell me which chair you think looks the most boring. All right. Which of these do you think is the most kind of normal, boring chair that maybe you've even sat on at an office or at school before? What do you think? You can either kind of count them over or describe them in the chat for me. Which is the most kind of boring, average, normal looking chair? Hmm. 
Well, for me, everyone, this one right here on the end, it looks the most boring and typical. So this is a pretty, and Lizette says green chair. Exactly. Yeah, this is kind of, you know, a standard looking office chair. And it tells us that just like on land, people held regular office jobs. And you know, while they were out at sea as well. And not everyone was, of course, a pilot or had to lift and lower the anchor. There were plenty of other important paperwork type jobs that had to get done too. So this is one type of job that we might have found on board, just someone sitting at a typical desk job. Now, I want you to uh, take a look at the screen once more here and tell me which one do you think looks the most comfortable? Which of these chairs do you think would be the most comfortable to sit on? Maybe, you know, something you could imagine curling up into kind of soft and cozy, you know, nice, maybe, you know, thing to, to curl up with a, a book, maybe a, a cup of hot cocoa as it gets colder, maybe. Any of these look soft and cozy to you? When I look at these, everyone, I think that this one, the brown ones here in the middle, look the most comfortable. And in fact, it kind of does look like a comfy recliner chair that you might even have in your own living room or maybe one of those really comfy movie theater seats, too. But believe it or not, these were used specifically for pilots in their ready room. Now, pilots had maybe the most stressful job on board the Intrepid. So the ready room really was designed to be as comfortable for them as possible. So here's a bunch of, of these pilots sitting in a ready room in these seats. And you can kind of think of the ready room as kind of like a classroom where they'd learn all about their missions. And underneath their seats, they even had their own little lockers for their things. Uh, they also even had desks that would kind of fold up and over to take notes. Maybe you've got those in your classroom too. And they would sit in these chairs to prepare for their flights. So it was kind of like a school chair, but a really, really comfy one. And I don't know about you, but if I was sitting in a chair like that in school, I might fall asleep. That might be a little too comfy for me. Now, after the pilots were in these chairs, they got into another chair. And that would be this one right here, right next to it. So does anyone know out there in the chat, what would you call a chair like this? What do you think? What do you call this big? It's this light greenish kind of looking colored one. Um, it's just to the right of it there with, you know, it's got all these straps on it. It's kind of a scary looking chair, not going to lie. Uh, but I bet all of those straps and all that padding might have something to do with it. If you look at the shape of it, also there's that thing hanging over the top there. Lots of stuff going on with that. This chair, everyone, is called an ejection chair. So you see, a long time ago, if something bad happened to your plane, you actually had to climb out, out of your cockpit. You had to climb out onto the wing of your plane and then jump off. And of course, hopefully you had a parachute with you and then you could just simply float down. But as you can imagine, that's super dangerous. And here is actually an image of an ejection chair that's being used on the left there. So you imagine if that plane is going forward, then the tail end of it, the back end of it, could get tangled up in your parachute after you jump, right? So these ejection seats were created where you would pull a handle on either the bottom or the top of the seat itself, and then it would shoot you up and away from your plane. So it would go down and then you would be able to then float back down safely with your parachute into the water below and not get tangled up on your plane. Now, if you landed in the ocean, sometimes you didn't quite land near your own ship and maybe another ship had to come to pick you up too. But all of your stuff, remember, is still back on maybe the Intrepid. So eventually you would then have to transfer ships. And this is where this last chair here on the end comes in. So this chair is called the High Line Chair and it works kind of like a zip line. So there was a rope, a cable actually, that would go through the top of the chair and it would connect it from one ship to another ship. And then it would just zip you across the water to get them back to the ship if you were on that. So here's a picture of it actually in action. All right. So you can see here, uh, you know, there's uh, somebody riding along the center of it. Um, and, you know, it looks a little bit like a wild ride, right? You've got all that waves, all those waves in between there. And I don't know, you might get a little, little wet there, right? So actually, there is a funny story about this seat. Uh, the Intrepid was a really big ship. And it was known for having, of course, really great food and something else very exciting, ice cream. So sometimes the ship that picked up a pilot would say, hey, we know you've got some really great ice cream over there. Uh, if you want your pilot back, you need to send us over some ice cream first. 
Now, the crew of the Intrepid was not about sharing their ice cream. So there is a story that one time they sent over some ice cream, but actually weighted it down with soap shavings. Now, of course, that made the other ship kind of mad. Uh, so to get back at the Intrepid, while they were sending the pilot back over across that very tight line, they moved their ship a little closer to the Intrepid, which put some slack into the line. Now, let me show you, actually. Let me demonstrate what that is going to look like here. So if we have our high line, all right, we've got our cable real tight and our ships are going, you know, right next to each other there. So you're going to have it pretty smooth and you're going to be able to zip that person one way or another in that chair. But by moving a little bit closer, look what's happening to that line. It is going to actually start to sink. You got some slack in that line. And ultimately what happened was, yeah, they ended up dunking that pilot right into the water. So I like to say, you know, maybe that pilot got an extra serving of sprinkles that day. Or maybe he got soft served. <laughs> so everyone, we're going to pause here before moving on and uh, see if we've got any questions so far. Any questions about life on board the Intrepid or anything like that? How many people served on the Intrepid? So the Intrepid typically on average had about 3,200 men at any time. Um, and again, they were out at sea for six to nine months at a time. So if you think about it, that's about the length of an entire school year, right? But also keep in mind, most of them were between the ages of about 18 to 23. So they were pretty young for, and for many of them, you know, this was really their first time away from home. So it was exciting, of course, but also kind of scary at the same time. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning that uh, throughout its 31 years in service, no women ever served on board, too, because, well, that's just how things were back then, unfortunately. But they did contribute a ton. Uh, women helped to build the Intrepid, first of all, because so many men, of course, were off fighting overseas. And, of course, we've all heard of the term Rosie the Riveter, right? So many women took on other factory jobs to build planes and engines during the war, too, uh, many of which flew off of the Intrepid. So their impact may not have been seen on on board, but it was definitely felt as well. Good question. Any others? How many planes do you have at the museum now? So at the Intrepid, I believe we currently have uh, 28 military aircraft on display uh, or, you know, in our restoration hangar being fixed up. Um, that also includes helicopters. And we also have uh, British Airways Concorde, the commercial jet out on our pier. And then in addition to that, we've also got a Cold War era submarine and, of course, a NASA space shuttle, the Enterprise. Uh, and it's all housed within the Intrepid itself, which is a national historic landmark. So lots of fun, cool stuff stuff to see and uh, we do hope you can come and visit soon. So let's talk a little bit about some of the planes that these pilots flew everyone. All right. So this is the Avenger. Now this is the oldest plane that we have at the museum. One of my favorites here. It's from World War II. And as you might have noticed here, the wings on this plane look a little unusual. Does anyone know why those wings happen to look like that? Hmm. Do you think they're maybe broken? They're all bended back, right? Because they're not out, right? They're not out extended the way that you might see on a normal plane that you might see at an airport. Um, maybe you've seen, you know, birds tuck their wings back when they dive. They kind of fold them back like that, right? Or, um, you know, even they're just, you know, sitting there uh, on a line or, or on the ground or something. They've got their wings folded back kind of like that. But, you know, this is an airplane, not a bird. So, hmm. Now, at the museum, everyone, we could, of course, intentionally choose to display airplanes, even if they were broken. Maybe we're trying to recreate a scene here where, you know, maybe they're doing a repair on a broken plane or something. But the real reason why these planes have foldable wings is really to save space on the ship. Now, everyone, again, if you put your arms oop, out to the side, all right, if you put your arms out to the side there and, you know, rotate around a little bit, you're going to notice you take up a lot of space, right? <laughs> maybe you're bumping into things around you. Uh, but, you know, maybe if you put your arms in or back down to the sides and you try doing that again, you'll notice that you're a bit narrower, right? So by doing this, uh, the planes could actually fit better. You could fit a lot more planes inside of a small space, kind of like the area that we see here. This is called the hangar deck. And this is where we'd store a lot of planes. You can kind of think of it like a garage, maybe um, a garage for airplanes. And uh, during World War II, they could actually store about 100 of these big planes on the ship there between the hangar deck and up on the flight deck as well. Now, looking at this massive machine, everyone, 
you might also, I'll show you a video here, you might also notice that the Avenger is pretty clunky. It's actually uh, got a, a nickname that is shared with a famous Thanksgiving meal. Thanksgiving's coming up next month. Anyone happen to know what that might be called? It's a bird. It's kind of big and awkward when it tries to fly. Anyone know? <laughs> so it is, of course, the turkey. And that is because it it folded its wings back. You know, if you look at that, it's also big and clunky when it flies. Uh, and so they thought, yeah, the turkey would be a great, great name um, to name this big plane. And looking at this, you might also be thinking, wow, gosh, how can something that big and that heavy get up into the sky and fly? How does all that metal stay all the way up there in the sky? Well, this plane and really all planes are able to fly by using a few forces. So the first one that we are going to talk about is, well, actually, basically what I just said, everyone. It is the reason that we cannot fly. It is the reason that we all actually want to stay on the ground. And it is uh, the thing that it helps us to control ourselves, actually, while we're up in the air. Very important thing. It is actually called gravity. There you go. <laughs> so gravity, everyone, as you might be surprised, is actually one of our four forces. It's the reason something big and heavy stays on the ground. It's the force that brings us down. So the heavier you are, the more gravity is going to work against you here, no matter how hard you try to fly. And that certainly applies to big, heavy airplanes as well. Now, again, it might sound kind of weird, but we do need gravity to make sure that we don't just float away here on Earth. So it does help us to manipulate our controls and to uh, also regulate how high we might go to. Now, you might have noticed this big twirly thing up there in front of the plane. All right. That uh, anyone happen to know in the chat what that thing is called? What is that thing? It's kind of like a spinning fan right in the front of your airplane. It spins really fast. Sometimes older planes have one or maybe even two or four of them sometimes. That is called, everyone, a propeller. Now, you might have heard of a propeller in another context, maybe being on a boat or a ship. And there we go. In fact, on the right, you can see another one here. This is one of the propellers that was on the Intrepid. So it spins and it pushes the ship through the water. But believe it or not, air is similar to water. It is also considered something called a fluid, all right? Now, that is not to be confused with a liquid like water, which is also a fluid, but air moves like water in a fluid way. So when you're swimming, all right, you're underwater, you're moving the water, and you're actually pushing it back behind you in order to go forward. And it's the very same idea with airplanes and with these propellers. They scoop the air and they move it. They push it back behind them as they go forward, which also allows it to move forward too. So that is actually our second force, and that is called thrust. Now that is the, again, forward motion that we want to achieve in order to move. And we can do that using things like propellers on the Avenger. But you might also be thinking to yourself, well, hey, now I have seen an airplane and, you know, the airplanes I'm used to seeing don't really look anything like that. The airplanes that I've seen don't have propellers. So how do they move? Well, here is another type of airplane. This is called a jet plane. And this one is in particular called the Fury. And yeah, you'd absolutely be right. It does look a little different than the last one we saw, right? So this one you might notice does not have a propeller on the front of it like the Avenger did. Now, jet planes generate their thrust to move a little bit differently. So here's something else you can try at home, everyone. If you take a deep breath in, all right, and then you let it out, that's actually how jet planes work with a few little extra added things too. They take a deep breath in the front. They take all that air in. Then they compress it. They mix it up with jet fuel. Then they ignite it, they set it on fire, and then all that comes out the back. And that is how you can also generate a lot, a lot of thrust for jet planes. Now, everyone, I'm going to ask you another question. All right, here we go. We're going to do a little game here. So tell me, which of these do you think is faster? Go ahead and tell me in the chat. If you think the Avenger, the first one that we talked about, is faster, go ahead and type a one. And if you think the Fury, the second one that we saw, is faster, type a two. 
And again, think about things like, first of all, how big it is, all right, the shape of the plane itself, the type of plane. Which one of these planes do you think is faster? So go ahead and type a one if you think it's the Avenger and type a two if you think it's the Fury. And I see a bunch of answers coming in, excellent. All right, so a one for Avenger or a two for the Fury. Which one of these do you think is faster? Again, the first one, Avenger, or the second one, the Fury. All right, everyone. And the answer is the Fury. There you go. And here's their top speed. So on the left, the Avenger, that big blue one again, it had a maximum speed of 276 miles per hour. But as you can see on the right, yeah, that Fury went a lot faster. That top speed is at 681 miles an hour. So that is twice as fast, more than twice as fast as the Avenger. And everyone, that actually has a lot to do with its shape, all right? So the shape and the size of a plane also happens to relate to our third force of flight. Now, you'll notice, everyone, that the Fury is a lot sleeker, all right? It's more streamlined than the Avenger. And so that third force of flight is actually something called drag. And that is really anything that gets in the way of air. So if you take your hand like this and you move it back and forward like that, you can actually feel the air resistance on your hand. So all that air coming in contact with your flat palm there, all right, that's drag. Your hand is causing drag against the air. So everyone, let's take a look at the Fury here, a little bit closer up here. And really comparing these two planes, you can also see how technology improved between when the Avenger was active during World War II and when the Fury was in service later in the 50s and 60s. So looking at this here, the Fury is a lot more compact, right? It's a lot more sleek. And that sleekness there is what we call aerodynamic. So it has less air resistance running into it than the Avenger, which is also much bigger and wider. So it can fly much faster. Now, the last force that we want to talk about has to do with something that we just paused on there. This thing, all right? This right here is on the wing. Now, this red shape, all right, on the side of the wing there, it's actually kind of in the middle of the wing because it's folded. That shape is something called an airfoil. And that is actually what helps the plane to go up. So our last force is the thing that actually lifts us off the ground. And I want you to imagine, everyone, that this plane, all right, it's moving forward very quickly. The air is moving towards the wing, and it's actually going to get split by that airfoil, all right? So you are going to have air going over both the top of it very, very quickly, and then also under the bottom of it a little bit slower. And actually, that difference in speed of the air moving along, it causes a difference in air pressure. So there's going to be high pressure on the bottom and low pressure on the top. And that high pressure area really wants to get to that low pressure area up there. So the pressure is going to build up on the bottom and push up. And that is going to cause the wing and the plane to go up. So that is something called Bernoulli's principle. And that last important part is what gives us lift. Now, you can think of this kind of like if you imagine you're in a grocery store and you're standing in a long line to check out and maybe suddenly another checkout line opens up and there's no one there. So what do you think is going to happen, right? What, what would you want to do in that situation? I think we can all say pretty much, yeah, we would go to the open line. You know, you don't have to wait in line any longer. You can just get your groceries. You can check out sooner. So the air pressure also really wants to do that. It wants to be in that low pressure area on top of the wing. So the faster you go, the more air you can get to go over that wing and the more lift that you have. But on the other hand, the more drag you have, the stuff that's in the way of the air, then the gravity can start to take over and you can land. So with all of these four forces in mind, everyone, we can also think about how planes don't just go forward, they also move, right? They turn left, they turn right. Uh, they can also do things like corkscrews and loops and barrel rolls and all kinds of tricks. And that has to do with some of the flight surfaces. So the different areas that the air hits on the plane, those are flight surfaces. And also the way that they interact with all their other components with the air hitting them allows you to move different ways. So if it's uneven, if maybe there's more drag on one side than the other, 
it's going to cause the plane to not fly straight. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. So if you take a look at this video here, this is an example on the back of the wings, we've got these pieces here called ailerons, and they would give you that roll motion. So you can imagine kind of like a dog rolling over to the left or to the right. And the word aileron is actually a French word. It means little wing, and it's on the back of those big wings. Now, on the back of the plane, horizontally on the tail part here, we've got some more flaps. These are called elevators, and they move the plane up and down just like that. That's called the pitch motion. So the nose goes up and down like that. And remember that kind of like, you know, your singing pitch can go up and down. That's how I like to remember that. And then on the back where you see those black stars on the yellow panel on the tail there, that's called the rudder. And that controls the yaw motion. That is side to side. As though, you know, you're kind of like you're shaking your head no, maybe. But all of these things together is how we steer our airplanes. And yeah, it's a little complicated. But really, when you add all of those dynamics together, you can do some really, really neat things with an airplane. And so, everyone, that is our four forces of flight. All right. We've got uh, gravity, which holds us down. We've got drag, which slows us down. But then we've also got thrust, which helps us to move forward, and lift, which brings us up. And all those combinations are ways that we can control our airplane. All right, so any questions before we move on about uh, any of these planes or about any of the four forces of flight so far? Any questions? Are Avengers still flown in the Navy today? So no, the Avengers actually entered service in 1942 during World War II, and they were used up to about the 1960s. Uh, and at that point, actually, actually, if you just saw there, um, better technology was being created. We started having these jet planes that moved so much faster, and they were a bit smaller and a little better suited to the changing nature of combat at the time as fighter jets. So a lot of those Avengers were either scrapped at the time or also just sold off. Um, many of them actually were used to spray uh, pesticides in fields, or also they became something called a water bomber for fields uh, because they could hold so much heavy stuff. Um, usually they were torpedo bombers, right? So they had these really heavy torpedoes, uh, but they would replace that with water. And so you'd fly over a field and, and dump all that water to water or pesticide, you know, uh, all, all of your fields. Um, so um, that's usually what they were used for. Or of course, you know, people have them in their private collections um, for things like reenactments or for air shows and things like that. But no, the Navy no longer uses them uh, for that purpose anymore. All right, any others? Why are the Avengers wings so big? Yeah, so the Avengers wings are actually 54 feet wide, believe it or not. Those are really, really big, really, really massive. And again, we talked about how they folded them back, right, to save space. But they also had to be so big to offset the tremendous weight of the plane, too. Typically, they weighed almost 18,000 pounds at takeoff. And that often, again, included like a 2,000-pound torpedo bomb and Remember, it's being powered by a propeller. So the thrust is not quite as powerful as a jet plane. So having those really big wings were really necessary to generate lift to get off the ground. And they really needed a lot of that high pressure pushing up to keep it in the air. So the wider surface there um, really helped them to do that. Great questions, everyone. All right, now um, remember I told you that we uh, used to launch and land planes off of the Intrepid, right? And that it is, you know, 913 feet long. So runways, everyone at airports are typically much, much longer than that. Planes, of course, need to be able to build up speed and thrust to generate lift, right? We just talked about those, um, but they need those in order to take off, to get into the air. So planes on the Intrepid would actually use steam catapults to get shot off the front of the ship. And, uh, you know, you can kind of imagine that like a slingshot almost, right? It would help them to build up all that speed much, much quicker. And you can actually see in this picture here, a track along the bottom, all right? And that track, uh, helps the planes. It would uh, attach onto the plane there, and then they would shoot it forward along that track in order to launch it off the plane. The landing is just as difficult because, again, we don't have a long runway to land on to slow down gradually either. So they had to do something a little bit different. They used something called a tail hook. And here is a picture of one on the back of one of our planes, the Tracer. So that is, uh, you know, that black and white kind of hooked shape thing. 
Um, kind of looks like a little candy cane, maybe a black and white candy cane uh, circled in red there on your screen. But this tail hook would actually drop down and snag onto a cable to slow you down from, say, 160 miles an hour uh, to zero in just two seconds and get you to land safety, ho hopefully. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of imagine you like you were playing Red Rover and you got stopped only a lot faster and harder. <laughs> uh, but, you know, again, you can see in these pictures here what that kind of looked like. There's a plane coming in for landing. On the left, there is that tail hook that is dropped down and uh, hopefully ready to snag onto a cable. And then on the right, you can see the cable uh, that it would catch onto to slow it down and stop it. So another successful landing here, albeit, again, quite an abrupt one. Now, helicopters actually work a little bit differently because they have propellers on the top of their aircraft. All right. So this red and white one that you see here is called the Sea Guardian. It was a Coast Guard rescue helicopter, and it could actually land on the water, believe it or not. You actually can see the buoys on the outsides over the wheels to help it float. So it would help to rescue people from the water. Um, if you've seen some of our other programs, maybe you also might notice that red and white color, very eye-catching there. But it would actually fly down vertically to save them and then up again away uh, to take them to safety. So helicopters are actually what we call a VTOL aircraft or vertical takeoff and landing because they can go up and down and even hover in one place. Now, the blades on the top, again, it gives it lift and they act similar to an airplane's wings. But in addition to the rotors that are on top, helicopters also have a rotor in the back. And you can see that in that picture there, too. So the rear, the rear rotor, um, that propeller can actually face a number of different directions, and that helps to give the helicopter the thrust it needs to move forwards or backwards or sideways or however it needs to move. So helicopters are really cool in that regard, but believe it or not, there are also some airplanes that can do that too. And they are also super cool. This is called the Harrier Jet. And you can actually see the vents right on uh, the middle of it, all right? So kind of under the wings, but in front of it there, where that big star, where that roundel is for America. So those vents, all right, those are kind of like, um, actually, if you look up closely, they look kind of like ribs or fish gills. They can actually be turned. They can turn up or down. They can push the air down, which then would make the plane go straight right? Because of the thrust. Or you can also rotate them backwards to help it go forward again by pushing all that air behind them. So it's a super cool aircraft. Um, and it can also actually land straight down as well. So it is the best of both worlds. It does use a lot of fuel to do it. Uh, but they don't need a runway necessarily to take off or land with this particular plane. Now, we've got two other planes that I'll show you. And just based on how they look, you can probably get a sense how they move and their speeds. So take a look at this. So everyone looking at this one, this long black one here, this is called the A-12. All right, it was actually a CIA spy plane and it was the fastest plane ever built. It, it had top speeds of uh, Mach 3, so that is three times faster than the speed of sound, over 2,100 miles an hour. And it could actually go so fast, it could fly from Washington DC to California in just over an hour. Now that's a trip that normally takes about five hours. So that's really fast. And if you look at it, you know, do you see a lot of surfaces there that might cause drag to slow it down? Not really, right? And as you might guess, it's very smooth. It's got that really sleek shape, really helps it to go fast, really helps the air to just run right over it. So it doesn't have a lot of drag at all. So that's something that you're definitely going to see in planes that move super, super fast. Now, on site, we also have this plane. This is the fastest commercial jet ever made. I mentioned this earlier. This is the Concorde. Now, this can actually fly at Mach 2, so not quite as fast as the A-12, but still really, really fast at twice the speed of sound. But you can really see the shape there, right? Do you see how pointy it is right at the front? It's streamlined. It's very sleek and smooth. It's also got very little drag. So it can also go very, very fast, almost 1,400 miles an hour. Uh, and this particular plane could make the seven-hour flight from New York City all the way across the pond to London in just two hours and 54 minutes. So just about three hours, definitely cutting it in less than half time. 
Now, with all of this in mind about flight surfaces, everyone, and about how planes can move kind of in relation to drag, you might recall earlier that I asked you to grab a few things, a sheet of paper and some scissors. All right. And everyone, we are actually now going to make our very own super cool paper airplane. Uh, if you happen to miss that earlier and you're just tuning in now, no worries. Go ahead and grab an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. Any kind of paper will do. It can have something printed on it. It's fine. Or it can just be plain uh, as a sheet of paper, too. Um, but go ahead and grab that and a pair of scissors. And again, if you're not able to use scissors, that's OK, too. You can just make some tears with your fingers uh, when we get to that part. Um, but just in case we've got some friends going, grab that. Uh, I just want to see if we've got any other questions before we move on. Any other questions? What happens if a pilot missed the cable for landing? Yeah, so that is, you know, something that they had to consider, right? As they're coming in from the back, uh, you've also got some planes that might be trying to go out to the front there. So you don't want them to crash. Um, the cable was there in order to get them to stop. There were a number of them stretched out across the flight deck. But in olden times, all right, you know, World War II, when we first had propeller planes, um, they actually would have a crash barrier that would pop up. And uh, hopefully, you know, be able to get in that the propellers, um, the, the arms of the propeller would get all tangled up in this net and it would stop it that way. You'd probably end up breaking, you know, the front part of the propeller there in the process. But at least you are safe and the pilots in front of you are safe and everyone else is safe. Uh, later on, though, they actually changed the flight deck configuration. So jet planes there, um, they actually have the the flight deck is more of an angle so now because they were going so fast if they couldn't actually latch onto one of those cables they would just be told to come in at full speed and just keep going they would they would miss it then they'd go right back up and come around and try again so you know it might have uh you know taken a little bit of practice when they started but those pilots were really really good and honestly if they missed it they actually were kind of, you know, made fun of by their friends because everyone was really, really good. So, yeah, that's what they would do. They would uh, hopefully just you know, be able to go around and take off again. All right. Any other questions? Why don't we use the Concorde anymore? Yeah, let's take a look at that Concorde one more time, right? So the Concorde was in service from 1976 to 2003. Uh, they actually retired them in 2003 for a few reasons. The first of which was actually money. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine a plane that goes that fast is pretty special, isn't it? Uh, and they knew that. So to purchase a ticket to fly on the Concorde was a luxury. It was very, very, very expensive. And eventually, they just couldn't get enough passengers to offset the cost of operating them. So it cost a lot of money. And, uh, you know, they figured it just wasn't really cost effective anymore to continue to do it. So they stopped making them. Um, there was, of course, some other safety concerns to them as well. But it was definitely something, um, you know, they really thought there was something onto it with that idea of being able to go supersonic. Um, and there were, you know, a number of people actually, including NASA, who are looking into a, a better way of being able to operate supersonic flights like this in the future. So who knows? Maybe we'll see more of that as we, uh, you know, move on. All right, everyone. So let's move on now to our uh, our activity. Now, once again, you will need an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper, as well as some scissors, if you'd like. So what we are going to do is create a very cool paper airplane. All right. Just like this. And you are going to be able to manipulate it however you want, based on some of those flight surfaces that we just talked about as well. So in order to do this, everyone, I am actually going to switch my view here. We're going to switch over to this. Here we go. Oops, let me get rid of this one here. All right. So everyone, take a look here at our Intrepid Cam. This is where I'm going to be doing this live for you. And you are going to be able to um, actually see. Let's see if I can get it any bigger. There we go. You are going to be able to follow along with me here. Um, on how to fold this particular plane. All right. So the first thing you want to do, everyone, is take your paper. And I like to say this is um, you're looking at it landscape. You're looking at it kind of hot dog style here. All right. So if you were to fold this uh, in half, you could either fold it like this hamburger style where it's fatter or you could fold it like this hot dog style. So it's a little bit thinner. So we are going to be folding it in half long ways, just like this hot dog style, as I say, so that you will have your paper folded in half long ways, just like this. All right. That is your first step. You are already making it even more sleek and streamlined just by folding it in half. 
Now, the next thing you want to do is open it up. And you'll see, of course, we've got that line right down the center of the paper. What you want to do is take your top two corners up here and you want to fold them in to that center line right there. All right. So here's an example. The first one to take the top right corner. You fold it in to that center line that you've got right there. Just along the line right there. So you'll have that edge meeting the center of your paper just like that. Easy peasy. All right. And then do the same thing on this side. So you're going to take that top left corner. You're going to fold it down to the center and crease it down like that. So now, once you've folded those in, you basically kind of made a little house here, right? All right, you've got that and you've got your little roof up here, those two triangles folded into the center. All right, so once again, if you're just joining us now, we have folded our paper in half, we've opened it up and we folded them in center right here at these top two corners. All right, so the next thing you wanna do everyone is take that right side of your house here and you wanna fold it in once more to the center line. So just like that. So you're gonna take this top edge, fold it right into the center line, and you're gonna be making a longer, sleeker line right here with this fold, all right? So that is what that's gonna look like on this right side. And then of course, do the same thing on the other side because we want our planes to be symmetrical, right? We want them to be the same on both sides. So same thing on this side, we're gonna take that side, fold it into the center line, and crease it down. And that, my friends, has created this delta shape, as we say, this triangle kind of looks like, you know, the Star Trek logo or the Space Force logo, not that they don't look exactly the same. All right, so we have our sleek line here. All right, our nice triangle. This is what we're looking at here. The next thing you want to do is fold it in half. Now, if you turn it sideways and you fold once again on that hot dog line that you first did, you fold it. All right, you're putting all of your folds on the inside of your plane, all right? So whether it's this way or it's this way, just fold it back up where it was and crease it back down. So again, all of the folds that you just made are now on the inside of your plane. You can think of it like it's all the engines inside of your plane, it's all of the people inside of the plane, whatever is inside your cargo in the plane, it's all inside. So on the outside, again, it's very smooth, very sleek and very smooth like that, okay? So all of your stuff, all your folds are on the inside. All right. So we've got this. The last thing you want to do, almost the last thing, is take your top edge, this angled edge here, and fold it down. Now, again, remember, all of your folds are on the inside so far. So when you fold this down, it's going to be a little thicker. might be a little bit harder to smash it down with your hands, but you got this. All right. You're going to fold down so that it is parallel, so it's right along the edge of the bottom there, just like that. All right, so this is what it should look like when you're doing that. And then flip it on over and do the same thing on the other side. All right, so you are gonna just fold it on down like that. All right, make it very smooth like that. Same thing on both sides. Now look at how small, how tight, how sleek, how streamlined that is. Kind of looks like the Concorde we were just looking at, right? But this is your plane. So you can go ahead and open up that top wing on the other side. All right, so this is how you'll be holding it and folding it. Holding it and folding it, <laughs> I just said that. All right, so this is how you'll be holding it from the bottom, all right? But this is how it looks when it's folded, all right? So this is our plane. And at this point now, if you wanna go ahead and throw it, see what it does. Does it move any certain direction or does it go in a straight line? What do you think? But you're gonna notice that this thing goes pretty straight. All right, there are not a lot of surfaces on it, right? There's not a lot of drag that it's creating. If it is coming at you straight up like that, I don't know if you can see it with this. Oh. If it's coming straight at you, it is actually going to not be, uh, you know, interacting anything there with the, with the air. So it's gonna go pretty smooth. But now we can actually play with it a little bit more and you can experiment with some flight surfaces. So the next thing, if you have your pair of scissors with you, you can go ahead and use those scissors to cut some flight surfaces, all right? So we can cut some elevators on the back, all right? So if you go ahead and right here on the back part of your wing, on both sides, oh, can't see me, there we go, right here, go ahead and cut maybe about, you know, half to three quarters of an inch in, right in the center there, like this, all right? So this little flap here is going to be one of your flight surfaces. 
don't necessarily fold it, but you can bend it. You can bend it kind of down and it'll stay a little bit, all right? You can bend it up too. Do that on both sides. All right, so you're gonna be cutting again, a little flat back here. And then you can fold it up or fold it down. Go ahead and try. See what happens if you fold them both up, all right? And throw it and see what happens if you folded them up. Go ahead and fold them both down and throw it and see what happens. And then if you really want to get, you know, experimental here, do one up and one down and see what happens to it. See what it'll do. And then the last thing you can also do as another flight surface is here on the back. All right. So um, if you go ahead and do the same thing through both of those layers there on the back. All right. So we have another little flap here. This is going to be your rudder. So this is usually on the tail. Often when you see an airplane, obviously this part is on the top part of your airplane, but for the purposes of our paper airplane, it'll be down here. But the air is still gonna intersect with it the very same way. So you can go ahead and move that flap to the left or to the right and see how that also affects how it will be flying uh, when, you, when you throw it. And that my friends, I have the wrong screen up here. There we go. That is how you can create your very own uh, controllable airplane. So I would love to know everyone, how did your plane come out? You can let us know. You can take a picture. You can tag us on social media. We'd love to see what you created and see what you discovered about what these different flight services do on your airplane. Good job. So everyone, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. If you've got any other questions about our programs, you can reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through social media. The museum hosts a number of live streams, so please do follow and subscribe to this channel and visit our website for the latest streaming schedule if you're interested. And also, if you enjoyed this or any of our past programs, we would love your feedback as well. There is a link in the chat that I encourage you to click on uh, in order to uh, answer just a couple questions that'll help us to plan for future sessions. So our next family program is Thursday next week at 3 p.m., and it will be Intrepid Women. So we are going to talk about the significant impact that women have had on the air and space industry throughout history and tell stories of some of the very brave and very unsung women who paved the way for gender equality in their field. So once again, that is Thursday next week at 3 p.m. right here on our streaming platforms. Um, once again, as a reminder, everyone, we are back open to the public seven days a week from 10 to 5. So if you do happen to be in the area, come on by and say hello. We would love to see you. And once again, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today and hopefully we'll see you online for another upcoming intrepid adventure thanks so much so much everyone see you next time